In today's video, I'm gonna be showing you how to produce in the style of Maverick City. This new piano-centered, sort of live band sounding worship sound, specifically in this sort of light gospel flavor, has become really popular in CCM and the worship scene recently. So I thought I would just do a quick breakdown of how I would get a style like this in sort of a self-produced setup. But before we jump into that, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Seth. I produce music under the name Velvet Ear. I work as a song completion producer, meaning I specialize in taking song ideas and turning them into finished tracks ready for Spotify. I do one of these videos every Thursday to show people how to produce their own music at home. Songs I've either produced or written have been on these Spotify curated playlists, and I did an entire album through Warner Music Group. So if you have a song idea that's been burning a hole in your pocket for a long time, check out the top link in the description and we can get started and find out what the next step for you is going to look like for getting that turned into a finished idea. All right, plug over onto the track. All right, first let's start off with me showing you what the track sounds like. All right, so let's start breaking down those elements one by one. I definitely think the most important element of this song is this piano. So in terms of writing piano parts for worship, I normally try to keep things pretty simple. I was listening to some Maverick City songs and I felt like most of the songs were very piano driven in terms of lead lines and chords. So what I normally do in these situations is I'll just grab a fifth with the right hand. Looks like I did an inversion of it here because it's in the key of E. And then I'll just play basic chords with my left hand. And I'll do sort of multiple passes through with MIDI. Sometimes I'll even do them on different piano tracks. And I'll just try to construct something. I'm not really the most avid piano player. So in terms of coming up with piano parts, I really like to not limit myself by what I can play. At the same time, I have some piano knowledge so I know what is unrealistic to expect for a piano player. So I basically have a root and a fifth in first inversion going throughout the entire song basic chords in a root and a fifth then i'm just playing five chords because they're kind of lower on the piano and when you get lower into the piano you really want to stick to like fifths or octaves just because it will muddy up the frequencies if you start doing thirds or seconds and then i added this lead line on top of it that's and another thing that I did with this style of music is I wanted to make sure that the song was constantly building because in worship music and CCM music, there tends to be really long builds over long periods of time. And you sort of have to do that through adding small elements gradually over a long period of time. So as you can see at this very beginning part, We're just hitting the left hand on those chord changes, but then when we get to the next section, when everything gets a bit more uh, higher energy. We're doing two chord, now it's doubled up. And then when we get to the biggest part of the song, we have one on every quarter note essentially. I 
I just wanted to replicate the feeling of being a piano player with like a live band setting because I've played in a lot of worship teams. And I know that the feeling of building off of the band and with the band is really important. For this piano sound, I'm just using this Addictive Keys preset. I'm using a modern upright on the Come On Up preset. Another thing with this piano performance is I really wanna make sure that I'm hitting that MIDI pretty hard. As you can see, it's still a bit dynamic, but you want stuff hitting a little bit harder because it is more of a high energy like rock song almost. But yeah, that's the piano. Now let's look at the bass. So for this bass, again, we're trying to keep things as simple as possible, and we're trying to replicate the feeling of a band building together. Worship music can be very simple to play, but it's really important to understand dynamics and exactly how your instrument plays into the roles of a band. So overplaying can really destroy a mix. So for this first part, we're just doing quarter notes. And then I didn't have time to track a new bass part, so I just started copy and pasting stuff, basically doubling up the time to match the drums. And then here at the end, I had it sort of doubling up that boom, boom, God, boom, boom, God, that the kick is doing. And then up here, I wanted to add a little bit of a fill. So I doubled it up and then half of these are actually transposed an octave up. This is a really janky way of adding a bass fill part, but if you're in a pinch and you need to do it, it kind of works. Then in terms of processing, I'm running into Guitar Rig 6 on this DI bass preset. Again, if you've seen my channel before, you know I actually prefer running basses into bass amp sims, just because I feel like it gives a bit more harmonic excitement than just running a straight DI. After that, did a little bit of EQ to tame some of the excess low end and this one frequency that was building up a bit. Added a compressor to kind of level it out a bit. A Little bit of L1 to really tame it. And then here I have a side chain compression that is tied to the kick drum sample. When you're doing this kind of compression, it's really important to make sure that you're having your attack and your release as fast as possible, just because you don't want the bass to go We're just trying to get rid of that initial hit when the kick drum and the bass are playing at the exact same time, and then you can just play with the ratio and the threshold until it feels right. Also, this is probably gonna be true for pretty much every single track on here, but I have this reverb send on this wooden room preset. And as you can see, pretty much every sound that I have is going to it either 100% or a pretty decent amount. Just because I was trying to emulate that sound that a church recording has. Again, like it's not the most ideal setup from a mixing standpoint, but if you're trying to get that sort of creative environment, using sort of like a shorter room reverb and just throwing it on everything can really help accentuate that live band feel. So like when I take it off, like there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it sounds pretty good, but when I throw that reverb on, It just makes it feel like you're in a church, which for recordings in this style is really important. There's a very large demographic of worship listeners who are actual people who work at churches in worship ministries. And most of the time, these songs are being played by their band members. So being able to hear what it sounds like in that context, I don't know, it's just a thing that we do and it, it sounds really cool. All right, next we are going to the most weirdest part, which is these acoustics. I 
as you can tell, they're not actual live acoustics. They are using this strummed acoustic contact library. Looks like I'm using the campfire progressions on this Western thing. I did this because I didn't really want the acoustics to be super present. I just wanted to add a little bit of that brightness and rhythmic quality that acoustics tend to add to worship music. So I just did the basic progressions and then I just layer them in slightly in the mix. Here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So here's with them. Them turned off. On. Like, it's one of those things where if somebody asked you, are there acoustic guitars in this song, you may not even be able to give them a straight answer, but the second you take them out, they really diminish the, the mid-range quality that you have in the track. In terms of mixing, I'm not really doing a whole lot. I'm using Soothe 2 to sort of pull down these sort of higher frequencies. I didn't want them to be overly bright, and that was just the best way I could get the results that I wanted. After that, I'm going into some Kramer tape. This is just adding a little bit of harmonic saturation, and on the 7.5 IPS speed, it actually kind of dulls the high end in an organic way. So with that turned off. And then I turn it on. It just tames it a little bit. I didn't want that super bright acoustic DI sound. And then it looks like I just threw an EQ to sort of tame some of the low end and pull down some of that lower mid range. So that is the acoustics. I then have this organ here. Organs are honestly always such a challenge for me because the whole sound of the instrument is just hyper resonant frequencies, which as a mixing engineer, you're normally trained to dial those out. So I had to like control myself to not go crazy with surgical EQ. But yeah, with all the effects off, this is what it sounds like. which is just one of the default contact library organs. Threw a little bit of EQ on it to control some of that excess low end. I really just wanted that sort of warbly feeling on the sides in the high end and the higher mid range. I didn't really want the low end from it. And then I threw H delay on it. Just to give it sort of a weird stereo vibe, specifically because this is a mono to stereo delay. So it sums down everything to mono and then makes it stereo, but only in the sense of delay, which I don't know, it just had like a weird effect to it and I just decided to keep it. And then again, threw it into that same room reverb. And then I added a little bit of ROM reverb to it. I normally go for ROM reverb a lot, but I was really trying to not go for it as much on this song because I didn't really feel like it fit this sort of like live church setting. This sort of like, super long decay, almost Strymon style reverb is really popular in the worship world as a whole, but not so much in Maverick City style stuff. They don't even really have a ton of electric guitar stuff. So I really tried to use longer reverbs sparingly on this track. But yeah, with all the effects, it sounds like this. Again, a bunch of super hyper resonant frequencies that I kind of generally want to cut out, but that's kind of the sound of an organ, so you just kind of have to live with that. Then we have this electric guitar part. So I knew I wanted a slide part, so I grabbed my Ibanez Artcore, which is basically a Gibson 335 style guitar, set it flat on my lap basically, and then I grabbed one of these sort of bar stool slides, which is actually probably not the best slide to use for a part like that. But yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit of an air, a little bit of a country vibe, because I've been doing a lot of country stuff lately. So I just set the guitar flat and then just did, I think it was a first, a second, a third, and then a fifth. And then for this first repetition, I think 
I just copied this note and then pasted it here. No, I'll, I'll show it to you actually. So this was the actual take that I did, but then for this first repetition, I wanted it to end on the second. So I just grabbed this guy and pasted it right here. And then some of you might be like, wow, Seth, you played that very cleanly. You must be really good at slide. No, I am not. If I take the auto tune off of it, this is what it sounds like. Like not too bad, but Like not too bad, but then when I throw it on. Normally whenever I'm doing an instrument that is like single note and kind of not as fretted as I would like it to be. I will normally throw some kind of tuning on it after the fact just to make it a little bit cleaner. That's also why I really like using Metatune from Slate Digital because you actually have this amount knob separate from your correction speed so you can actually dial in like how much of it you want. So yeah, I just said to the key that I was in, which is E major and just let it do its thing. In terms of the tone, I'm using this beautiful dirt preset from Guitar Egg 6. I did change it quite a bit. I changed the brightness. I think normally the brightness is turned on and it's on normal and these knobs are different. And I specifically added the Sledgehammer Overdrive. It's kind of like the most transparent overdrive that this plugin has. And I really didn't want to change the tone that I had. I just wanted there to be more of it, which is why you would choose the Sledgehammer over something like this Screamer which is more of like a tube screamer style overdrive. But yeah, a lot of the presets that come in Guitar Rig 6 are actually very useful. I think I also threw this 1176 compressor pre-delay uh, just because I wanted to be a little bit more leveled before it went in. After that, I did some basic EQ. If you watch any of my videos before, you know I actually like to low pass my electrics because I don't really like this excessive high end. Again, a little bit more delay. For lead electric stuff, I really like the ping pong setting. This actually right here is probably my default for this HLA plugin, which is analog all the way off dry wet about here. I'll normally change the rate to whatever sounds the most interesting. So I think this is actually on a dotted eighth delay by default, but I think for this song and the rhythm that I was playing on that electric lead line, I think just an eighth worked better. And then some high pass and some low pass to sort of get rid of the super high end repeats and the low end buildup that can happen. And then same as the organ, threw it into the room reverb and a bit of the wrong reverb. All right, I think the last thing we're gonna talk about is the drums. So here's what the drum bus sounds like. I approached this drum sound the same way that I approach most of my drum sounds. So I grabbed this contact library kit that I really like. This is the GGD One Kit Wonder Modern Fusion Kit. It's just a super solid kit that doesn't have a lot of CPU usage. Also, I really love the minor symbols that they have for this kit. It's just all of them are very practical and very usable. And again, similar to like the piano or the bass, I really wanted to make a drum beat that sounded like it was building dynamically throughout the song. So as you can see at the beginning here, it's just playing a kick, some toms, and then it's stepping on the hi-hat a bit. And then it sort of like leads in with the crashes. And then right there, it doubles up the kick. And that's really the only thing that changes there. A, a lot of people underestimate how much tension you can build just by changing up one element. Because these two sections of MIDI are actually exactly the same, only the kick is more on the quarter notes here. But it just builds the energy so well. And then after it goes through that one time, I add a snare. We're also doing the crashes a bit more often uh, than in the previous one. So as you can see here, we're only really doing them at the beginning, at the end. This one we're doing at the beginning, middle, the end, and then one in the middle. And when here, this one, we're basically doing it like every bar or every two bars.
and then it leads into this with the snare, floor tom, and kick. And then we go to uh, a ride, some open hats, um, and then a really simple like four on the floor with a little bit of a, a 16th note, like a dum dum at the beginning of it. And this makes the song feel so much more dynamic. This almost feels like f three or four different sections of a song, but really all we're doing, all we're doing is changing the drum part that we're playing and then the rhythm that we're playing on the keys and the bass. And it makes such a big difference. And then underneath that main kit, we just have these two samples here. Actually just one sample. So uh, this kick sample is actually only being used to trigger that side chain compression on the bass. So it's not even really audible in the mix. And then this snare sample is just layering up whenever the snare hits, which is a really cracky snare. Um, and then I'm using this compressor on the drum bus so it doesn't feel like you have multiple snares going at once. It sort of tames everything together, sort of mushes everything down. You can see it really catches it there. We then have these two percussion layers, which is a shaker and a tambourine. They just add a little bit of excitement. I also love adding those elements specifically when I have a drum beat where we're really like quarter note on the ride heavy. Like it's it's very dun 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 dun. I really like the rhythm of it to go like dun 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 but sometimes that's too much for the drums to play so percussion can be a really great way of adding that sort of movement without really making your drummer super busy. And then of course, on the drop, we have Clap Impact, the greatest white noise crash sound ever. Just adds a bit of impact on that specific hit. And those are all the musical elements. And so let's look at the mastering chain real quick. So it's pretty basic compared to all of my other chains if you've seen any of my past videos before. One change that I did do is right now I'm playing with instead of using bus force from Arturia for this sort of like parallel processing, I'm playing a bit more with this aggressive preset on Slate Virtual Bus Compressor, essentially just compressing the crap out of it and then pulling the mix back. Like that's really heavy compression, but when you pull it back, it's not as crazy. And then the rest of the chain, I'm using some upward compression. Again, with mastering chain stuff, I like to bring up those lower points and not necessarily squash the higher parts. Using some max bass from Waves on this ultra low extender preset to just sort of bring up that subharmonic low end. Adding a little bit of fresh air from Slate on this higher air just to give it some more high end excitement. I'm currently in the middle of trying Saturn 2 from FabFilter and I'm actually really happy with it. So it says buy now, but I'm, by the next video, you're probably gonna see that I've bought it. Uh, this is really cool. And I really prefer it to the other Ozone Exciter that I was using previously because you can separate your bands into these different sections and really control them in an organic way. I don't even really know how to describe it. What I've done here is I've separated the lows, the mids, and the highs apart from each other. The lows, I've deactivated the saturator. And on the lows and the highs, I'm actually doing nothing. I've deactivated them. But in the middle here, if we listen to it, I've added a, quite a bit of tape saturation, so if I turn the mix up here. It's pretty heavy, but if I pull it back, that's about where it was. And then blending that in, it just adds this sort of mid-range depth that I like. Without it. It just feels like the mid-range wakes up when I do that. And then, like I've said before, some additive EQ to bring up some frequencies. 
mainly use that for bringing up vocals if there's a track with vocals on it. And then we're also using an EQ to sort of add some stereo width. So this shelf and these two notches are actually boosting the sides on the specific frequencies. So that's actually what it's boosting. So if I turn it off, things just kind of get a little bit closer to the center. But when I turn it on, things just kind of open up a little bit. And then I prefer using two limiters when I do mastering stuff. So this first one is the vintage limiter, more on the analog setting. It's just doing a lot of heavy lifting to bring things up to a bit of a higher level so that this other limiter doesn't actually have to work as hard. I just like using the maximizer on the modern setting and dialing it in until I get it exactly where I want it. But yeah, that's what everything sounds like. So now let's listen to everything all together. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and hit subscribe and all that stuff. Again, I do one of these videos every Thursday, so if you enjoy this kind of content or if you get something out of it, I would love to hear about it. Also, if you have a specific sound that you would like to hear, please put it in the comments below. I'm not a big channel, so I will probably do it. You should also check out this video I did last week where I showed you how I released my last Emo Trap single. Walks through all the steps of the process of actually releasing a single, starting with a song idea and ending with video promotional material and all that back end stuff. But yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you guys next week.